Formula One, often referred to as the pinnacle of motorsports. It's been the face of racing for so many years now, and I, a very, very intellectual F1 fan, am going to attempt to explain it. Except I'm not exactly very intellectual. Now, Formula One, with all of its glamour, beauty, speed, adrenaline, and engineering, is essentially 20 rich guys driving in circles. Thank you so much for watching. Nothing, just an incident. Now, of course, Formula One isn't just 20 millionaires driving in circles, but the circles are on crack, although, not gonna lie, it's kinda, kinda accurate. But you know, Formula One is so much more than that, and I'm gonna bring you guys deep down the rabbit hole. Obviously, some of you are probably watching this because you wanna try to get into Formula One, which is relatively pretty easy, as you can probably tell. But if you're already a diehard fan, Okay, I kind of don't know why the hell you're still watching this video, but hey, you know, this video is gonna be one hell of a journey. So grab your popcorn, clear your tears away if you're a Ferrari fan, grab your Red Bull or your Monster Energy, and this is gonna be Formula One Explained by an Idiot. All right, so starting off with the basic stuff, F1 is a sport where 10 teams with two drivers each race for points that tally up to a driver's world championship, which is equivalent to like the Piston Cup. The F1 season starts in late February and ends in November. December to February is essentially the season break where there's no F1, AKA the time where I lose my sanity and curl up into a ball and start crying. But it's also the time where some spicy F1 news gets released. In work terms, it's like hearing your favorite manager got fired or a coworker moved to the rival's business. So there are 24 different races this year and in each race drivers essentially score points and the one with the most points wins the championship. Points are only given to drivers who finish within the top 10, essentially saying skill issue to the other 10 drivers on the grid. Once again, most unsportive driver of the Suck grid. My balls, mate. But aside from that, these points also tally up to a constructors championship, which is the combined points of the two drivers in a team. The team with the most points from both drivers takes the constructors championship and the higher the team places, the more money that they get. Now, every single team in F1 has two drivers. There's no way around that. You can't have three, probably just a reserve driver, which is essentially somebody to back up the other two drivers in case somebody gets sick. So every team has to have two drivers, except for Aston Martin, because Lance Stroll is incapable of being a good driver. You've got to lift it. No. I'm a new idiot, man. <laughs> How can you be so useless, man? Now, each team before the season starts develops a car that follows the regulations set by the FIA. If you don't know what the FIA is, it stands for forever an insufferable pain in the ass. No, Mikey, no, no, Mikey, that was so not right. So the FIA basically makes these regulations that all teams have to follow to make their cars, and each team has to try to develop the fastest car which will help their drivers win points. Now, the development of the car also involves engines. So far, there are four engine manufacturers in F1, which are Mercedes, Ferrari, Honda, and Renault. Teams will have to choose an engine to work with and they have to create the most aerodynamically efficient car on the grid. Because if they don't, something like this happens. All right, guys, so ready up for me to nerd out. I'm straight up going to look like this. And this time I'm going to be speed running some F1 terms you need to know. Pretty much the ones you need to know to understand everything that I'm going to say. Because if I don't include this part, I'll actually just sound like a professional yapper throughout the video. Okay, so here we go. Pole position. It's basically where a driver qualifies with the fastest time and starts first on the grid. Charles Leclerc is very familiar with that, but is incapable of winning from that position. Next is a podium. No, it's not the thing that Joe Biden stands on when he's trying to deliver a speech. Big emphasis on the word trying. America is a nation that can be defined in a single word. I was going to put him in uh, foot, foot. Instead, a podium in F1 is where a driver finishes within the top three, essentially second or third, as they get to stand on a podium after a race and potentially break another person's trophy. Another term is back markers. The teams or drivers that are all the way back of the competition. They're just there, all the way back there, which is something that Nikita Mazepin is very familiar with. Moving on, we have P1, P2, and P3. The P is for position, and the number after that is, well, it's kind of obvious. If, if you do not understand that, I swear to God, there is no hope for you to understand Formula 1. Pit stops are where drivers change their tires and you start to hear flies in your ears. 
And finally, DRS, which makes your car go faster as its rear wing opens, which allows for less drag. And it can only be active in the DRS zones of a racetrack. If you don't know what it stands for once again, then this video will certainly help you out. And then he, then they start catching up, he'll be grateful. You know what DRS stands for, Noah? You're putting a good distance. Suck my dick. All right, so now we have the race weekends. It's essentially the schedule of an F1 race, which takes place on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Friday is free practice where drivers familiarize themselves with the track. Saturday is qualifying, which determines where you place on the grid. And Sunday is the race day. But not gonna lie, I'm kind of not really satisfied with that explanation. A more accurate way to put the race weekend is essentially Friday, everybody is delusional. Saturday, Ferrari fans are extremely happy. And on Sunday, Red Bull fans are extremely happy as we hear the Dutch national anthem for the 23rd time in a year. Oh, it's textbook stuff, Max. No, come on, stop the shit. <laughs> Okay, so what happens once the race goes on? What happens after it's lights out and away we go? Well, believe it or not, it's not just cars going in circles over and over. Although most of it is pretty much that. But no, you know, there's something called tire wear, which I'm gonna explain as clearly as possible in bedroom terms. There's the hard tires, which last the longest. There's the soft tires, which finishes the fastest. Medium tires are kind of the in-between. Wet tires is used when the track gets spicy and slippery. And the final tire compound is intermediates, which are used when the track is somewhat wet, which is about one to three milliliters damp, whereas for wets, it's ideal for when the track is really wet, like something around four milliliters damp and above. I just sounded like the biggest nerd in history. My goodness. Pardon my F1 addiction, guys. It's actually incurable. Like I would be watching F1 while doing literally anything to the point where I would run out of content to watch and start watching videos of a monkey putting out the fastest lap in a race. Anyways, we have pit stops. So this is where the teams switch out their tires in a race. Teams are required to pit at least once and change to a different tire compound. So once again, in bedroom terms, when you're hard and she's wet, you probably don't last as long as a pit stop, which is like sub three seconds. I have no idea if you guys understood that. But just as a rundown of what it's like when F1 teams pit, Red Bull's pit stops usually go like this. While Ferrari's pit stops are pretty much this. There's not a single intermediate tire in sight. They came in, whether that was a driver who called it or... As for strategy, different races means different tires can be used. For example, there could be races that require drivers to have two pit stops because their tires don't last as long, or some people would go on a one-stop strategy and risk it all. Strategies can change depending on the situation, but essentially the teams opt for the most optimal tire combo, except for Ferrari. He's tried everything! Box, Carlos, box. Oh. Confirmed not box. now, not now! Oh, why, not were now. They, why were they telling you? to pay Now with all of the info on Formula One, which you guys just had thrown into your faces like Logan Sargent whenever he sees a barrier, you're probably wondering which team should I support? And well, that's an amazing question because me being, you know, a very intelligent Formula One fan, I'm going to give you guys the most accurate guide on F1 teams and drivers. Trust me, you will never see more accurate information in the world than this video. It's a Ferrari! It's a shitbox! Ferrari. So this team has pretty much had depressed drivers and fans since 2007. They do completely abysmal team strategies that make you think that you're high on crack and has completely destroyed their past legacy of being the strongest team in Formula One. Their driver Charles Leclerc has probably spent a million dollars on his therapist after the tragedy, also called the 2022 season. And he's probably gonna spend more after his contract extension. Now, if you don't know how this contract stuff works, basically these drivers are like employees and can get replaced or kept when their contract expires. Like the other driver, Carlos Sainz, who is going to be replaced by Lewis Hamilton in 2025. Hey guys, is it, is it hammer time yet? A copy, we are checking. We'll change your car. You've got a problem, change your f***ing car. Next up is Red Bull. Their theme song is pretty much the Dutch national anthem or... Some of their fans started supporting them probably because they're Dutch or their team has been losing too much to the point where supporting Red Bull is their only way of coping. Red Bull also has the literal F-35 fighter jet as their Formula One car since their chief technical officer has an entire research facility built into his head. As for their drivers, their main driver has daddy issues and their second driver forgot how to drive in 2023. <laughs> 
I've crashed it. I've crashed it almost immediately. No biking, no, no biking. That was so not right. As for Mercedes, their team principal has a deep hatred for headsets, and they used to dominate a couple years ago, but now they completely forgot how to build a car. Now, Mercedes fans are some of the funniest people out there, but also some of the most ungodly annoying fans in the world, particularly Team LH, aka Lewis Hamilton Glazers, still talking about him being eight-time world champion, which I do understand if you find the 2021 season controversial, but these guys are literally putting eight-time world champion literally everywhere. Like, I would see comments saying that Lewis is eight-time world champion in a YouTube video analyzing the Cars movie. Now, of course, I'm not going to target all of you Mercedes fans out there. There are some of you guys who are, you know, actually normal. But to all of the Team LH fans out there, instead of yapping about how the FIA is racist, instead use that energy to pray that Lewis has a good therapist since he's going to Ferrari in 2025. Also, Mercedes's other driver, George Russell, has a crippling addiction of crashing into people. To the outside to cover off Carlos Sainz, trying to go wide, and there you go, George Russell just. He just fully turned into me. And radio check, please. I'm moving up and down, side to side, like a roller coaster. McLaren is basically the papaya team. They're orange and a team with a really, really rich history and a strong one as well, as long as we decide to ignore their, you know, McLaren-Honda partnership. Overall, they're a strong powerhouse in F1 along with Mercedes, Ferrari, and Red Bull. As for their drivers, Lando Norris can't finish P1 probably until he's like 73 years old and is mentally incapable of saying anything normal in an interview. Can you see that? Man's had a good moustache. It might be that I'd, I'm, I'm not able to grow. While Oscar Piastri is really talented and so happy that he literally looks like this. Now, Alpine is what I call the schizophrenic team. Like, literally, these guys are fighting absolutely no one other than their own imaginations. They're just a team that's just there. They don't stand out, but if you like a car that's pink, like one of my friends who doesn't know jack about F1, then sure, you can definitely support them. Now, what about their drivers? You know, how good are they? Well, all you need to know about them is that they're both French. Okay, on to the next team. Valtteri, it's James. Please abort the fastest lap attempt for the end of the lap. For Williams, money ruined their capability to keep up in recent times. They've had a rich history like the other big powerhouses. Williams used to be a backmarker team for a couple of years, but their comeback has been slow but strong. I could say the same for my academics. Actually, never mind. Not really. I've actually been doing awful. I'm just deluding myself. Anyways, as for their drivers, Logan Sargent and Alex Albin, one of them doesn't know what a kilometer is, and the other one is very nice. That was honestly the best summary I could come up for these two, I'm gonna kill myself. <laughs> Aston Martin showed huge promise at the start of the 2023 season until they scrambled like maniacs not knowing how to develop their car. Also, yeah guys, throughout the season, teams in F1 can introduce upgrades to their car as long as they don't reach the cost cap, which is a limit of how much they can spend throughout the year. Now, most of the time, upgrades work brilliantly, except for whatever Aston Martin has been putting into their cars halfway throughout 2023. When it comes to their drivers, one of them is a 75-year-old rookie who makes TikToks every day but still keeps up with the competition. And their other driver is so consistently garbage that another team even roasted him in an interview. Hey. Dominating. <laughs> all right, one more. This um, is like Alonzo and Stroll. Uh, you, you having, are you having fun with this? You all right with this, guys? I can't get enough of both of you. You let the team down. Haas, Sauber, and the RB Formula One team. Now, these three are just there, you know? It's really sad. They don't stand out. They're essentially the back markers. And when it comes to their drivers, one driver is allergic to finishing in the podiums. Another got his wife pregnant after getting pole position. This one is the type to get friend zoned. The other guy is a Finnish Australian who posts pics of his butt online. Another dude is planning to open a restaurant but never does it despite having millions of dollars. And the final driver is a high performance athlete. Athlete. I'm a high performance athlete. Um, athlete sweat. Sweat baby. Ki, ki, ki. Sweat, sweat. <laughs> Now, so far throughout the start of the video and until now, I've been saying that F1 is literally the pinnacle of motorsports, apart from the Cars movie, of course. But what makes F1 so good? Well, it's the crashes and accidents, which usually go like this. Super soft rubber on, now ready to attack. Wait, wait, what's the problem? Took it, ah, there's a wheel in the, in the car! Ah! So crashes and accidents in F1 are not just entertaining, but they can cause the track to be dangerous. And this results in flags being waved during a session. One of them is the yellow flag, 
flag, single ones which are usually waved when a car goes off track or a minor incident happens, while double yellow flags are for hazardous things. Next up is the red flag, which are for major incidents like Zhou Guan Yu getting his car turned into a fidget spinner, Charles Leclerc crashing in Monaco for like the 50th time, and Sergio Perez in literally every race in 2023. Now there's also other flags like the blue flag, which warns slower cars that a faster one is approaching them. There's the black flag for a penalty warning or a disqualification, green flag which means that the race is on again, and finally the checkered flag where drivers decide the winner through a chess game after the race. Th that was a joke in case you guys couldn't tell. Another amazing part of F1 are the team radios, which my boy Fernando Alonso here is known for some iconic ones like these. Mate, I have no brakes, no tires, we are out of the points. Try to do whatever, but I don't care too much. Don't forget that there's also Kimi Raikkonen who talks more on the radio than he does anywhere else. Quite famous by you two. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Hey! Hey! Steering wheel! Somebody tell him to give it to me! In F1, there's also rivalries like Charles and Max throughout the start of the 2022 season until Ferrari completely destroyed Charles' mental health. There's also the iconic 2021 season, which also had a rivalry between Max and Lewis, where these two were so attracted to each other in the race that the FIA almost gave them a penalty for public display of affection. <laughs> Alright, so next up are the rules, which are made by the FIA, who decide on who gets punished when they break the rules. And well, they are known for some pretty controversial decisions, which really just explains the forever and insufferable pain in the ass. But anyways, here's me speedrunning some of the most important rules in F1. So track limits, if four wheels of your car gets off the white lines of a track, they blow you up. If you're speeding in the pit lane, you're going too fast, they blow you up. Overtaking rules, you kiss another car, they blow you up. And lastly, the final and most important rule, if you're Romain Grosjean, you actually blow up. Okay, let's go and get him. Yeah. I have it. I have it printed out. All right, so the next aspect of Formula One are its team principles. Now, these guys are pretty much the leader of their teams and are the people who are guiding them to victory. Now, the team principle of Mercedes, Toto Wolf, is known for printing things out, and he's pretty much a mafia boss turned into Pookie Bear in recent seasons. They function in moment, not. That's har harassment! Next up is Christian Horner, the team principal of Red Bull. He got unbelievably roasted by Martin Brundle. Jane, you're too old to have driven here, really. I am too old to have driven here, but... Uh, you would have liked it. Yeah. Shame you wasn't fast enough to get to Formula One. Oh! And there's also the team principal of Aston Martin, Mike Crack. I'm not gonna say anything about his name. Next up is James Valls, who still gives severe nightmares to Valtteri Bottas. It is uh, really doing this. He's Valtteri, it's James. Please abort the fastest lap attempt for the end of the lap. Next is Andrea Stella, the team principal for McLaren. I honestly didn't even know this guy was team principal. Like, I still think it's Pookie Bear Zach Brown because, like, he's just 10 times more entertaining despite him being cringy in some certain moments. Come abbiamo fatto noi. A river dirty. Finally, it's gonna be Gunter Steiner. Now, I know he was replaced recently, but piss off, you know, he's still in my heart. Anyway, Gunter is the type of guy to swear nine times in a sentence with only five words in it. He does not smash my door. Tell him that. If he doesn't want to come back, he better tell me now. Is he just about yeah, now? Yeah. He smashed my fucking office door. So that is Formula One and the best explanation that I can come up for it. It's obviously, you know, the most accurate explanation of the sport, but I might still have probably missed a couple of things throughout making this video. So if I did miss out on anything, be sure to let me know. But what I do know though, is that even if I might've fumbled, I didn't fumble as hard as Lance Stroll did in 2023. Thank you so much for watching.